Jackson's family tweeted through his ex account saying that he was surrounded by his family. They asked for privacy and grace during uh, their time of transition. You know, you may recall that Simpson made NFL Hall of Fame uh, after an 11 year career with San Francisco and Buffalo. He was also infamously at the forefront of a major criminal trial in the 1990s after he was accused of murdering his ex-wife, Nicole Brown Simpson, and her friend, Ron Goldman. Simpson was later acquitted on all of those charges, but perhaps it overshadowed any of his co accomplishments, whether it be in football or in broadcasting. He did later, though, serve time in prison for a robbery attempt. Uh, he served nine years in a Nevada prison after uh, trying to reclaim some of his memorabilia. After the acquittal uh, connected to the murders of Nicole Brown Simpson and Ron Goldman, he was found liable for wrongful death and owed millions of dollars. This is a CBS News special report. I'm Gail King here in New York. We have just learned this morning that O.J. Simpson has died at the age of 76. His agent said he had been suffering from prostate cancer. Now, this news comes on social media from the family of the former star running back who was tried and acquitted for the murder of his ex-wife and then found liable for her death in a lawsuit. Simpson's life story is extraordinary. He grew up poor in San Francisco, became a sports legend who won the Heisman Trophy while playing for the University of Southern California back in 90, 1968 and set records in the NFL and then moved into acting and TV work. He was one of the most desired commercial endorsers in the 1970s and 80s, but his career fell apart in 1995 when he was accused of stabbing his ex-wife, Nicole Brown Simpson, and a friend of hers, Ron Goldman in her home in Los Angeles. He was arrested after a long, infamous police chase that lasted for hours. After one of the most controversial trials in recent memory, Simpson was found not guilty of both murders. Goldman's family then sued O.J. Simpson, and a jury ordered him to pay $33 million in a wrongful death judgment. But that was not the end of his legal troubles. In 2008, he was convicted in a kidnapping and robbery scheme involving some of his own memorabilia. He served nine years in prison before he was paroled in 2017. Joining me now by phone is journalist Ed Gordon, who covered the O.J. Simpson trial for BET, and he was the first journalist to interview Simpson after his acquittal. Ed Gordon, good morning to you. Good morning, Gail. Ed, I actually remember that day. I was watching that interview. I think the, the country was riveted to that interview because we all wanted to hear what O.J. Simpson had to say. What, were your, what was your thought when you heard that he had passed away this morning? I literally, Gail, am at an airport. I just got off the plane and uh, checked my phone. Needless to say, I was getting all kind of calls and texts, and it is a, a bit surreal. I mean, we all can go at any moment. But to think about, as you read, uh, who O.J. Simpson was, uh, this star running back, arguably at his time, the greatest running back of all time in the NFL, then to become a pitchman and a, a movie star. And then, um, you know, the tragedy that befell the Goldman family and what it's become. And so I, I think back, Gail, as you know, uh, how divided this country was based on that trial. It's extraordinary. Mm -hmm. Ed, I still remember when that verdict came in. He's, he's still proved to be, I think, up until the end, a very divisive character. At the time, it seemed to be divided among racial lines. You know, I remember there was a lot of celebration in the streets from some members of the black community, and a lot of people were just in shock when the verdict came in when he was acquitted. What do you remember about that time? Well, I remember that specifically, and I also think it's important for us to say, Gail, that I think a lot of African Americans had their doubts as to whether he was innocent or not, and much of the yes. cheering was not necessarily for O.J. Simpson, as much as it was for someone who, as misguided as this may sound at first glance, uh, had beat the system, that African Americans had uh, for so many years been railroaded into jail that you finally had someone rich enough uh, and powerful enough to maybe, and I underline that, evade the system. But it's an extraordinary time that we live through. Uh, you know, you think about the white Bronco and the chase and all that led up to his arrest. And um, I don't know that we would be able to even think about the proportion of it today simply because 
social media, think about this, Gail, had he been on mm -hmm. the freeway, even though the helicopters uh, followed him, he would have had so many camera angles from phones and everybody trying to be, uh, you know, the reporter on the scene. It's just an extraordinary time. You know, he was uh, acquitted in, the, in that case, but there was forever still a cloud over O.J. Simpson. And how do you think he navigated that? Because, you know, many times he would still be walking in the streets, people were asking for his autograph, yeah. wanting to take a photo with him, and still there were others that saw him as a pariah. That's a great question, Gail. I had been with him on a number of occasions after the fact, and what he would do is when he would see someone looking at him, he would quickly go to them and say hello to them before they could say anything. It was a, a disarming tactic on his part, if you will. So if he was afraid they were going to say something uh, rude or vile, uh, he would try to disarm them with because he was a charismatic person. Uh, he was bigger than life in, in, in many instances. And so he would try to speak first, and, and he was, and some people will rail at this, but he was charming at times. And so he, he leaned on that charm to disarm people. Yeah, charming is not what the Goldman family feels about him or no, many members. Not. Of, certainly no, not. No, 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 the Goldman family or the Simpson family. And I was always thinking about them during times like this. Yeah, and it's, it's hard to really kind of put your arms around this. It didn't bring any of those uh, people back. It didn't ease the pain of uh, those families who still today grieve the loss of those two people. And, and he always, Ed, even right up until the end, he always maintained that he was innocent. He did maintain that, uh, as you say, until the day he passed away. Uh, and he was quick to suggest that uh, he always was, in his words, searching for the killer. There were those who will suggest he never did that. But he did maintain he had absolutely nothing to do with it. And as hard as that is uh, to believe uh, for many people, and you think about this, Gail, for as long as it's been since those gruesome murders, O.J. Simpson remained, up until uh, he died, uh, the face of a murderer for many. Even today, mm -hmm. there yes. will be uh, comedians who will use him as the butt of a joke. And so it was, uh, it was something that stuck to him until his last days. Ed Gordon, thank you so much. When I got the news, you know, listen, we had heard that he was sick and that had been sick for a while, but it was still very um, jarring to get the news because it just brought back all the memories about that trial. And I still, to this day, keep thinking about the tragedy of the Simpson family and the Ron Goldman family. Thank you, Ed Gordon. Thank you for, for talking with us this morning. Just a reminder, we are remembering O.J. Simpson. He has died at the age of 76. His agent said that he had been suffering from prostate cancer. O.J. Simpson's family said that he was surrounded by his children and his grandchildren when he died last night. There will be more coverage on our streaming service, CBS News 24-7, and tonight on the CBS Evening News with Nora O'Donnell. Many of you will now return to CBS Mornings. This has been a CBS News special report. I'm Gail King, CBS News here in New York. So we are continuing to follow this breaking news this morning. O.J. Simpson has died at the age of 76 after a battle with prostate cancer. Uh, Simpson was diagnosed in February and was undergoing chemotherapy. There had been reports that perhaps he was in hospice care, reports that he denied. His family tweeted, though, on his uh, ex account saying that he was surrounded by family and they asked for privacy and grace during their time of transition. Simpson made the NFL Hall of Fame after an 11-year career with San Francisco and Buffalo. He was also infamously at the forefront of a major criminal trial in the 1990s after he was accused of murdering his ex-wife, Nicole Brown Simpson, and her friend, Ron Goldman. Uh, perhaps that trial uh, has overshadowed any of his accomplishments on the field or during his broadcasting career as well. Uh, he was acquitted. Of all those uh, charges, though, but in a separate case, Simpson served nine years in prison after being found guilty for a 2007 armed robbery in Las Vegas. He was released on parole in uh, 2000. He was released on parole, I believe, in 2017.
Um, and so now there will be a lot of discussion about his life and legacy, a powerhouse on the field, an incredibly impactful a spokesperson and broadcaster. But the trial for the murders of Nicole Brown Simpson and Ron Goldman is what looms large. Um, the entire country was transfixed, uh, not only when there was news of the murder, but on the day that he was supposed to turn himself into police, he slipped away and embarked on this hours-long slow-speed chase in the back of that white Bronco. The nation was riveted. The chase was covered on cable news, followed by helicopters and news cameras. And really, the entire nation stopped to watch this unfold. Eventually, uh, he returned back to his home, and uh, the reports are that he was given a chance to go inside his Brentwood home, drink some orange juice, and then turn himself in. The trial itself was a moment in American history. It was one of the first times that cable news was able to air a trial from beginning to end. And he had with him what was called a dream team of attorneys. Um, Johnny Cochran, Robert Kardashian, now his own children are almost more famous than Robert Kardashian, uh, Robert Shapiro and F. Lee Bailey. And they embarked on a defense that was riveting. Anyone who watched this trial remembers sort of the key words. Uh, if it doesn't fit, you must acquit. Something so close to that. And it all had to do with whether or not a glove fit on O.J. Simpson's hands. That was a sort of a key pivotal moment in the trial. Um, so you heard Ed Gordon talking with uh, Gail King just a short time ago, and he's joining us now. He was the first journalist to speak with Simpson after that infamous acquittal. Thank you so much for uh, pivoting over to us, um, Ed. This is one of that trial it, and the conclusion of that trial. It's one of those moments where if you were alive, you remember where you were at the time. And that's right. As the viewers know, Ed, I was not in this country at the time. I was in Canada. I was still in school and no one was in class. Everyone was watching the verdict. And there were cheers and there were groans. It was a moment of, of sort of great division. It was all of that. And if you think about the trial, and uh, as you noted, uh, it was broadcast daily. It became a true reality show. You know, we call reality shows that, but they are not. And this had people transfixed. People were skipping not only class, some people would skip work at times, and certainly uh, work had stopped altogether the day the verdict was announced. And if ever we uh, wanted to see an indication, we talk so much about the division in this nation uh, between the races today, but if ever we went, wanted to see and see an illustration of that, that certainly uh, the day that verdict came down uh, was, was it uh, when you looked at the personification of division. Yeah, I think that's uh, so clear. And I think, um, excuse me, Ed, um, as I clear my throat a little, I think that over time, people's uh, opinions about that verdict evolved and changed. But at that moment, and you sort of really articulated it really well with, with Gail, there was this idea that the justice system is rigged against African Americans. And for once, here is a black man who is able to beat the system. Um, it, it seems sort of ludicrous at the time, but that was sort of part of the logic for many people when, when they saw him being acquitted. Yeah, that was certainly part of the ethos. And I think uh, the other divisions that you saw, people wanted to know where you lined up before the verdict came down. Uh, you know, I can recall many white colleagues asking me, well, what do you think? What do you mm. feel about O.J.? Uh, it was a real sense of, quite frankly, uh, the, the, the idea of are you for us or are you against us? And it was yeah. that simple for them. And so, uh, again, we don't want to lose sight that uh, two people lost their lives in all of this in a gruesome way. And it's very sad, and we still all grieve and pray for those family members. You never get over something like that, yeah. even after all of these years. But we also have to remember that the Simpson family, um, you know, certainly had a rough go of it. His children had a rough go of it after the fact. Uh, and so there were no 
winners. There was no way to, um, you know, button this up neatly. This yeah. was just a sad day uh, across the board. Yeah, I know certainly it was a frustration for the for the Goldman family and uh, for the Simpson family, for Nicole's sister, who became a very sort of out outspoken um, advocate for those who were victims of domestic violence. It was very frustrating for them to watch O.J. Simpson not only walk free, but also kind of become a kind of like a cult personality almost. Um, it, it was, it, yeah, it was a, it was something that they tried to remind the public that these, these two people had been murdered. Um, but as time went on, there was increased distance between the horror of the crime and this sort of character that O.J. Simpson um, became. Um, Ed, I want you to just sort of hang on a little bit, because I want to bring in CBS News legal analyst Ricky Kleeman. Ricky, were you... I, I think Court TV, this kind of put Court TV on the map. Were you working for Court TV at the time? Not only was I working for Court TV, Anne Marie, but I was specifically hired uh, in order to anchor the O.J. Simpson case. So that was the beginning of my television career. Mm. And the first appearance that I had had on Court TV was at the preliminary hearing. And then during the course of 1995, uh, was in Los Angeles with the late, great Fred Graham to anchor the case for Court TV. Then I also followed on television for Court TV the robbery trial that later happened in uh, Las Vegas. And then finally, for CBS, did um, the parole hearing. So he has really been part of the arc of this second career for me after practicing law. I think that there can be no doubt, as the previous commentators have noted, that the day of the verdict was a day of reckoning in this country. And we really saw the difficulty of the race divide on that day. When you were present for those many months in Los Angeles, watching the trial all day long, commenting, analyzing the trial, you had a different feeling when you were watching it on camera than when you had a moment where you were allowed to go into the courtroom and realize the charisma of this man. He would be brought from his holding cell. And there are those people, and they're very few indeed, who have something about them that the room vibrates from them. And of course, the infamous moment at the trial that I think none of us could ever forget every viewer in the country who saw it was the day he tried on the glove right. and that the glove did not fit. And of course it created Johnny Cochran's brilliant closing argument, if it doesn't fit, you must acquit. We knew anyway that I would say Fred Graham and I knew that there could be no doubt that after the jury had deliberated uh, for four hours on the first day and then said that they had a verdict and that the verdict would be announced the following day, it had to have been an acquittal because they could not have possibly sifted through all those months worth of evidence to come up with a guilty verdict. Mm -hmm. So we were up on the scaffold, and when you look down, there were demonstrators all over the streets. It was a bit of a circus, a carnival, uh, people wearing O.J. Simpson masks, having T-shirts uh, already with a, if it doesn't fit, um, you must acquit. And what got lost in that, which goes back to your previous guest, what got lost in that was the horror of the crime. What got lost in that was the anguish of the victim's families and the people who were so invested in having O.J. Simpson convicted. Keep in mind what other facts in my soliloquy here, if you will, that this was one of the first cases that was televised nationally where the defense, in great part, was that O.J. Simpson was framed, that the glove had been dropped by a police officer named mm. Mark Furman from, to uh, frame O.J. Simpson, that the blood had been carried by a detective Van Adder uh, and brought back to the crime scene because he didn't log it into the property office. There were all kinds of factors 
that could have led to the not guilty verdict, including the prosecutor's decision to try the case in downtown Los Angeles instead of in court in Santa Monica, where they would have had a very different jury. Um, I'm so glad that you brought that up, Ed, uh, that, that you brought that up, Ricky. And I want to pivot over to Ed to add, like, a little more kind of historical context, because, you know, Ricky brought up Mark Furman, and that became kind of a whole other conversation about the LAPD, about the relationship that the LAPD had with the African-American community. And I think that also added to the feeling that many people, many black people felt about O.J. Simpson's acquittal. I think it's important that we note that both can be true. Uh, as we look back um, historically on the way that uh, the crime scene was handled, Van Adder and the others, and certainly uh, the baggage that Mark Furman brought to the table, uh, mm -hmm. you know, all became mm -hmm. part of the mix. Uh, you know, if it were a Hollywood movie, people would say, well, that's, that's just way too much. Yeah. Um, and so certainly uh, the dubious relationship that the LAPD had with African Americans over the years had to factor in people's uh, thoughts of, you know, it, it being believable that some of the things that uh, were whispered about that possibly could have happened, a frame up and the like, could not be dismissed uh, easily. And so uh, all of these things, you know, the, the, the confluence of everything that happened really made this what it was. It was a phenomenon. It was a, an extraordinary time for this nation and, and, quite frankly, much bigger than simply the trial. It, it really was. Um, and, Ricky, I want you to talk a little bit about you know, O.J. Simpson was the central figure, but it was like everyone else involved became these larger-than-life characters as well. Mark Furman, certainly one of them. Uh, Marsha Clark and Christopher Darden. You know, I remember kind of people watching what Marsha Clark wore and how she wore her hair and, and, and of course, the dream team of attorneys. Um, it, it was like we were watching a movie unfold and not a criminal trial. It was the sublime and the ridiculous all at the same time. Uh, I had gotten to know Johnny Cochran prior to this, was actually in his office uh, when he received the call to be a part of the team. Mm. Uh, and so um, I was on the phone with Carl Douglas, as Ricky suggested, when uh, the idea or the word came down that the verdict was back. And Carl said, I got to go. We got a verdict. And I said, you can't. <laughs> like Ricky, I thought, how could they have a verdict this quickly? And he said, I'll call you back. And he hung up because they had to get back. Uh, he had left thinking, OK, they're not going to come back this quickly. Yeah. So many people had to rush back to the courthouse. And so, um, you know, I don't think anyone who was, wasn't was born or wasn't old enough to recall what this was, I don't think we can fully articulate and yeah. explain the, the chokehold that this trial and this murder and these incidents had on this nation and, and on the world, quite frankly. Yeah, you know, Ed, I, I think you're spot on with that. And as both of you are talking, there are these images that are kind of coming back to me, right? Of course, the image of O.J. Simpson trying to fit this glove on his hand. When the announcement of the acquittal happens and, and uh, you know, O.J. Simpson's face and Johnny Cochran's hand on his shoulder and Robert Kardashian's face at the time, because I remember, I remember the conversation was that Robert Kardashian almost looked stunned, like he himself did not expect that verdict. Ricky, I'm wondering if you got a chance to talk to any sort of, in your career, any of any of the members of the Dream Team about what it was like to participate in this trial? I was friends uh, before the trial, during and after the trial, with both Barry Sheck and Peter Neufeld, who were the science guys. And this was a trial in great part based on DNA, having to do with that blood sample uh, and where blood should have been and where blood wasn't and where blood was. They were friends, as I say, for many, many years uh, and still are. Johnny Cochran and I became friends during the trial. We had an extraordinary friendship and then later did a TV show together uh, called Cochran and Company. I was company. And um, Johnny Cochran uh, came to my surprise 50th birthday 
And then my husband and I, I think we would say we were quite honored to be on the guest list for Johnny Cochran's funeral, which was one of the most amazing things I have ever witnessed. And of course, Johnny Cochran was a civil rights lawyer. Mm. He was a women's rights lawyer. He was a champion for people who did not have money and fame. And when he was at this funeral, of which there were literally thousands of people, both outside and inside, and you had people outside Johnny Cochran's funeral with one of of many of Johnny Cochran's books who were weeping. It was an extraordinary display, particularly of the African-American community, of what he meant to them. Mm -hmm. And the answer to your question is yes, I have spoken with those people about how they reacted at the time of the verdict. But what happens in a private conversation of recollection is that I think, as Ed says, people were stunned on the defense team, and yet they knew because of the length of the deliberation and because of the power of Johnny Cochran's closing argument. And as I mentioned, the charisma of Simpson tying on that glove as close to the jury pool as about a foot away. And he went from juror to juror mm-hmm. that all things were going to bring back in a play. Yeah. Um, Ed, you know, over the years after the acquittal, um, you know, yes, he had a huge judgment against him for wrongful death, millions of dollars that he owed. He had to start selling a lot of his uh, property to try and raise some of this money to go to the Goldman, Goldman and so I think, I believe, Simpson family, but certainly the Goldman family. Um, and then there was this kind of odd spiral. Um, he wrote a book, If I Did It. Um, he, at, at one point, sort of dabbled in kind of like a, a prank show. Um, uh, and there, I, it, it, it felt like when it came to the general public, there was a reaction to the verdict, and then slowly people were like, can you just go away? Can you stop talking? You knew O.J. Simpson. I'm wondering, you know, did he ever kind of speak about kind of his evolving, um, the way the public sort of approached him and felt about him, the way it has changed over the decades? Well, I think that people have to realize uh, he knew he was a pariah. And when we think about the idea of some of the things that he did after the fact, uh, there was a need for him to also make money, uh, quite frankly. Mm. And so uh, some of the things that many people saw as in poor taste um, or dubious, um, you know, some of that was simply that he felt like it's not like I'm going to get a corporate job. It's not like people are going to look at me. And he, he told me this. We were looking at doing another interview with him, and I sat down at dinner with him to try to convince him. And he said to me, it's not like people are forgiving me for this. It's not like the justice system in this country says if you go through trial and you are um, presumed innocent at that point, at least the verdict came, came down that way, uh, that you should be allowed to live your life. And he understood that did not apply to him. Hmm. What do you suppose, though? And. For, for many people, he would have been treated as a pariah, but for many people, he was still somewhat of a celebrity. How do you, how was he able to hang on to that? Well, I, I don't think it's him hanging on to it. I think it's America's obsession with celebrity. Mm. And I, as I said to him at dinner, um, because people were coming over asking for his autograph, and this was, you know, years after the trial, um, And he talked about still being famous. And I said to him that night, you realize that it's more infamy than fame Mm. now. Uh, But either way, you still get the adulation or at least the attention uh, from people. And I think that was less on OJ. He treasured being a celebrity before this. He certainly uh, did not mind it. Um, But I would say that it that I think speaks more to people. Um, than it does O.J. Mm-hmm. Um, Ricky, I want to talk about another personality that was kind of forced into the spotlight, the judge in that case, Lance Ito. 
and I'm trying to recall sort of how I felt about him at the time, but I think he received some criticism, um, which is inevitable when it, you're dealing with such a high-profile case. Cedo is really the primary reason why many states uh, and perhaps the federal system as well has tried to keep cameras out of the courtroom. Um, if anyone was enamored with celebrity at the time, it was Judge Lance Ito. And one of the clocks that we would keep track of at Court TV uh, was the clock of how, ma how many minutes per day that court was actually in session with the jury and how many minutes per day Judge Ito was in his chambers having conferences, that's a kind way of putting it, mm. with celebrities. I remember the day, for example, that Barbara Walters came to court, and so he invited her back, and they uh, had conversations, and everyone is waiting for the trial to continue on. He I'm was really in. fascinated with his I'm own uh, three or four more minutes. Mm, such a, so interesting. You're bringing it all back to me um, now. Uh, I want to bring in uh, one more voice for us. Uh, bring in Entertainment Tonight co-host Michelle Turner. She's joining us uh, now on the phone. Um, Michelle, w we have been talking about um, O.J. Simpson's life, but you know, inevitably, we're talking an awful lot about the trial, not just yeah. the crime, but also the cultural moment um, that occurred during this trial and the evolving cultural character, I guess, of O.J. Simpson. Mm -hmm. It's sort of hard to sum up, and it's really hard to explain if you weren't kind of really paying attention back then, because the way people have felt about O.J. Simpson has, has changed radically uh, since, you know, his time on the football field to now his death. Yes, absolutely. I mean, you know, you think about that trial, I think it was watched by about 150 million people on court TV. And that was, you know, in the inception and really cemented court TV and what court room, uh, you know, played those playing out on television, what that looked like for us. It, it was the public's fascination with it. I'm actually watching, you know, video of this trial on television right now. And um, it, it was so fascinating at the time because, yes, we, we had this figure who was beloved on the football field and then also had made his mark in Hollywood. I mean, he, you know, was in several Naked Gun movies and he was in the Towering Inferno and he had all the, the Hertz rental car ads of OJ running through and jumping over, you know, things in the airport. All of those things mm -hmm. is how we saw him and we saw him as a beloved figure. And then here you had this just incredible shift. Um, and we're all seeing this play out in front of us on television. And it became also a bit of, of why we are such a voyeuristic society and in Hollywood as well, because we were consuming all of this on a daily basis and no one could get enough. Yeah, no one it, could get enough of seeing this. It, it, it's so true. And, uh, you know, we talked a little bit earlier uh, with Ed about um, how divisive this trial was, how it was mm -hmm. a moment in time um, when, uh, you know, it was a moment in time when the LAPD was under a lot of criticism for the relationship that it had with yes. African Americans. It just seems stunning when I think about how there were cheers when he was acquitted and how that, that changed over time. But can you kind of bring us back to, yeah. you know, how you were feeling or how people felt when that acquittal came down? I remember where I was. Mm -hmm. So I was I was a college student, and I was working. I was working in a retail store when the when the um, when it was handed down. When the verdict was handed down, and and I remember just silence mm. um, because I was also working in a place where there weren't um, a lot of minorities, and it was just silence. But I what I remember distinctly was that split screen of people watching. And there were people, I think it was like in Inglewood, and then there were a, a, a video uh, of, of people somewhere else. And it was like black people and white people. And just the dichotomy of the two reactions, I, I still remember that's burned into my head of how when you saw the, the community of mostly minority people, there were cheers. And then mm -hmm. the community of white people, they were sitting stunned. And you're right, that mm -hmm. sentiment has changed over time, but it, it, it was all part of, of what 
the division was in the country at the time because we had seen, um, you know, we had seen um, the, the Watts riots. We had seen the um, the 92 riots in L.A. Mm-hmm. from Rodney King. And we had seen like these images of police brutality and what people felt like um, how black men had been treated. So then here you have this black man who may not have been connected to the black community and and of his own doing and uh, and of his own, um, you know, saying may not have really been connected to the black community at that time, but the black community still felt like he's one of our own and they connected to the police brutality part of it and what they saw as an injustice in a lot of ways with the system. And they, connected to OJ in that way. Um, And so we saw all of that playing out. And I remember even conversations within my own family, how people were split and how, you know, some people would say, oh, he didn't do it. He was set up because we also saw Mark Furman, Mm -hmm. who, you know, I, a lot of people in a lot of ways feel like won that case for the defense in his actions and his words and what he was doing, and people really did feel like the police had planted evidence. But then on the other side, you saw people saying, guys, let's just, let's be logical here. Look at all of this evidence, and why is he on this, this, why are they chasing him? And also remember that day of the low-speed chase with the Bronco, the NBA Finals were on the air at that time. And it uh, really, there was a split screen on television of the NBA finals in a picture in picture and the OJ chase. And they didn't really know what to do. Do they air the NBA finals or do they air the OJ chase? I mean, it was such huge news at that time. Man, Michelle, you hit on so many layers, just sort of taking me back in time. And, you know, you you sort of said this very quickly, but you talked about O.J. Simpson's connection to the African-American community at the time. Mm-hmm. And that's another layer, right? He's married to this beautiful white woman. He's living in a very wealthy section of uh, of L.A. Um, and and many of the people that he's associating with are, are white. And there was a conversation yeah. about, geez, when the tip are down, when your back is against the wall, now you're remembering. You come back to the exactly, black community. Exactly, right. exactly, yeah. which also led to kind of a division within the community about how they felt about this case, about O.J. Simpson. Um, I want to acknowledge that Lana Zach has come, and she's sitting right, hey, next, to, uh, right next to me. Lana, it's really good to see you. It's great to have you here. Um, as I, we were talking earlier, pretty much everyone remembers where they Absolutely. were when this verdict came down, right? And for me, I was still in school, but we were not going to class. And they had put a TV up in kind of like the general meeting area, because I was in college, the general meeting area, and everyone was transfixed. Right. And we were I was all kids. in Canada. We were all kids and we were all watching this. Right. And and we didn't actually have the guidance to try and process no. what was happening. But we knew that race was involved, yeah. social justice was involved, questions about how black and brown people in uh, um, interact with the police. Yep. Uh, all of that was something that we as children were trying to navigate during yeah. this time. And then our feelings about that became even more complicated as O.J. Simpson continued to live his life. And as you mentioned before, mm-hmm. the book that he published, mm-hmm. If I Did It, and how that also added so much to uh, to us as a so- society as we're trying to process yeah. and understand it. And I'm so grateful that we have Ricky Kleeman here who was part of trying to help a nation understand that. Uh, Ricky, how much were you obviously acutely aware of these other conversations that were happening at kitchen tables um, and lunchroom tables Mm -hmm. uh, in in some cases, um, and how this this, uh, trial actually addressed that at times in the courtroom? I think that all of us who were working on the case live in Los Angeles on this whole block of scaffolds where each network had a set um, up in the air, that we would also meet late at night. We would get done around 8.30, 9 o'clock at night, and we would tend to have a, a, a great deal of our conversations because our life was all in common. So we shared stories that we heard from family. We shared stories we heard from friends. And of course, we also all read the news. And so we really understood 
that these conversations were happening around the country. And of course, amongst us, the anchors and reporters, these conversations were happening with us. Um, I had the, the privilege uh, of anchoring and having as my guests some of the finest lawyers from the greater Los Angeles area who would be up with me for uh, two or three, sometimes four hours at a time, sitting up on the scaffold. And when we were not on camera, because we were watching the case, we would also converse. And you really saw that many of the lawyers and uh, academicians who were uh, guests were torn because you could look at the case in terms of just prosecution and defense, and you could also look at the case in a much deeper way, which was about society. And it was also the thought of how the public viewed the police at the time and how the African-American public in Los Angeles was truly an oppressed population at that time. You had the police culture at that time, which was anything but good. And then you had the African-American population, their culture, who feared the brutality, who feared the corruption. One of the things I remember best uh, of, of the discussions about that was we, as uh, people uh, participating in explaining the case to America, we were given the copies of the discovery that would come out, that would be made public. And one of the things we saw were, uh, was all the information about Mark Berman's uh, hearing uh, to get a disability to go off the job. So if we had it, the defense had it. And so when Epley Bailey cross-examined Mark Furman on the witness stand, and here Mark Furman is the detective who is being accused of planting the glove on O.J. Simpson's property. And Epley Bailey knows because he's read what I've read, which says about the word, which tells about the words that Mark Furman has used as to why he, feel he feels he should no longer have a badge and a gun. So when Ethne Bailey asks, have you ever used the N-word in the yeah. past year? There was only one principal answer because it was all about why he wanted to get that disability. And Mark Furman lied. Mm -hmm. said. And F. Lee Bailey had him dead to rights. So what you saw was being reflected in the living rooms, in the bedrooms of people around the country. Another thought I had about that was we knew that people around the country who were working during the day, they would tape the trial. And when they came home at night, they would watch the trial at night. So for years after that, all of us who were simply the people who explained the trial to the public, we were seen on the street as, oh, that's the man or the woman who was involved in the O.J. Simpson case. So it changed our lives. And what we need to remember is that we are merely chroniclers of history. The history was made on that terrible night when Nicole Brown and Ronald Goldman were savagely murdered. The fact was history was made on the day of the O.J. Simpson verdict. I'm really proud that I was able to help educate people in America at a time when they hungered for the real analysis of cases. I think in many ways, we may see that again this year. We had you in the beginning of this brand new network, Court TV. Um, Nichelle, I know you've got to go, so I just want to kind of ask you kind of for uh, some maybe closing mm -hmm. thoughts. You know, just thinking about O.J. Simpson's sort of uh, his life arc, going from sort of poor kid to phenom on the football field. It's really sort of an, an all-American hero story. Very much so. Uh, to what he became 
um, in sort of these last days. We found out that he had prostate cancer in February, but before that, he was kind of like, you know, the punchline for late night talk show sure. jokes and, uh, you know, quick hits on TMZ if they needed something. Um, mm -hmm. I'm just kind of, I'm, I, I'm trying to sort of digest um, how he will be remembered um, now, now that he's passed on. Well, I, you know, I work in Hollywood, and it, it seems like it's like the quintessential Hollywood script, right? Mm -hmm. Like someone, would, this, is, this is what um, writers would, would write a movie about, is this, this man who pulled himself up by the bootstraps. He, in 1968, wins the Heisman Trophy, goes on to have this incredible NFL career, then becomes um, even larger than life you know, as uh, a spokesperson, an actor, and a beloved figure in Hollywood, and marries the beautiful woman, and, and they're kind of the it couple in a lot of ways, and has all the famous friends, you know, connected to the Kardashians and all of that, and then it turns, and that's act two, you know, and, mm -hmm. and, and I, it just... Um, you know, I, I grew up a football fan, so in, in the early days, you, you can't deny what he did in that realm, but the life after football is is so murky and so riddled with with just um, ills and and violence and um, all of these things. I mean, and then don't forget when he was found guilty um, civilly, and then afterwards he spent nine years in prison because he was found guilty of armed robbery and things for trying to, in his words, get his memorabilia back that had been stolen from him. There, there's just so much there, so much meat there in a life of 76 years. Mm -hmm. um, and where in the beginning of his life, you would think we would be, you know, eulogizing him in, in the words of this football hero. We're actually talking about him in a very tragic and, um, and sad state of a person who most people in this country believe is a double murderer. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's, uh, it's a very, it's a tough day to talk about this. I mean, we're leading our show with this tonight. I called to say, how are we handling this? <laughs> um, and they're like, no, 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 we're leading our show. And I thought, well, of course we are, but at the same time, wow, you know, it's, it's just, there's a lot of emotions surrounding it. There's a, and people are going to be talking about this for a long time. I mean, in a lot of ways, he was the birth of court TV. Yeah. You know, he cemented all of these things for us. Um, and in his, his last days, I mean, uh, his family says they were surrounded by him and they say he was loved. And, um, and, and I guess that's, here we are, you know, yeah. here we are. It, it's just, it's hard to put into words everything because like you said, we've all been talking about this and I've been listening to you all talk and I thought, oh gosh, yeah, I forgot that. And, mm -hmm. oh, what? I forgot about Judge Ito. And, and I, I sat down with Christopher Darden, I remember for a very long conversation, and we got so deep into the fact that he, you know, was castigated as a black man for being on the prosecution team. And there was just so many layers to the OJ story yeah. and a life lived that, that, you know, we'll be talking about it for, for ages to come. And that all is of those, so true. And all of those layers, they, in, internal to them, were conflict. Yes. That at one level, you, you think, well, the police are wrong. They planted evidence. And then at another level, you think, he's wrong. He clearly did it. Right. And then another level, you think, no, the, the glove doesn't fit, right. right? Like, there were so many layers to all of so this. So many layers. And so yeah. many of them were in direct contrast yeah. to one and, another. And questions about what is justice. Yes. Really. Right. Um, and and, and at the end of the day, the Brown, the, Brown, the Brown family and the Goldman family still do not feel like they have gotten justice. I mean, even in the civil case, they got a $30 million judgment, and they— have only been paid about a half a million or mm. yes, about $500,000 of that judgment from memorabilia sales. So at the end of the day, they still don't feel like they have gotten justice and those yeah. two people are dead. Yeah. Yes. And, uh, and they would obviously never feel like no. they had justice, even if they had yeah. received full payment. Um, Michelle, it's been so good talking to you. Yes. Thank you so much for jumping on the phone uh, so quickly with us. Thank you all too. I appreciate it. So we're going to bring in CBS News radio journalist Allison Keyes. She's joining us now on the phone. She covered the Simpson trial with ABC News 
back in the 1990s. And I think, you know, we'll just start with kind of like your most vivid memories, because I feel like, Lana, as we talk about O.J. Simpson and, and his life, there are iconic images yes. like that, him mm -hmm. holding up his, what we're showing, just so you know, him holding up his hands and the glove not fitting. Um, the, the moment he was acquitted, um, the image of uh, Nicole Brown Simpson with bruises on her mm -hmm. face when they were, was talk about, you know, the domestic violence that she endured. So I want to ask you, Allison, kind of what are the images that come flooding back when we talk about this? Well, obviously, the day of his acquittal and the glove. I must say, I was a writer-producer at uh, ABC News in Chicago, so it was my task to watch that trial all day, every day. And it was really hard, especially because O.J. Simpson meant so much to the black community. He was a black man, made good. He was a celebrity. He played mentor to LeVar Burton's Kunta Kinte and Roots. You could see him running through the airport in the, Hertz, in the Hertz commercials. He was on Naked Gun. He was a football star. So this is a man the black community was like, aha, see, we can do this, despite the racism in Hollywood, despite the racism in the nation. So this whole thing just blew people's minds. And it was really difficult to be black journalists watching this and then having those discussions with white journalists were like, how can you not think he's guilty? And I'm like, okay, I'm a journalist. I'm not the one that chooses that. But there are a lot of questions here. Black America thought he was framed in a lot of ways. They thought that evidence was planted. They didn't believe this man could do such a thing. At the beginning of his case, he was like, I am absolutely 100 percent not guilty. And then when Johnny Cochran, who became famous in his own right, helped had Simpson try to put on those gloves and said, if it doesn't fit, you must acquit, people were like, yeah, he's not guilty. So when he was found not guilty, it was a huge wedge between blacks and whites, not only in the newsroom, but on the street. You couldn't walk into a restaurant or a bar without people talking about this and yelling at each other. And I think it really exposed you know, the ongoing racial divide in the nation. All that, Allison, because I, I also was thinking about uh, O.J. and Nicole Brown Simpson's children who straddle that line mm -hmm. um, between yes. black America and white America. And then we're also straddling this line of is dad a killer? Yes. Mom is dead. Um, all of that. Uh, I wonder if you know anything about how they're doing, the relationship that they have with their father, obviously the relationship uh, with Nicole Brown Simpson's family was fractured and, and never came back from that. But um, as a kid, seeing these other kids uh, and thinking about them going through that, mm -hmm. I think it was, it was also part of us trying to navigate and understand this conflicted Because history. these are kids that should have had everything in life, right? Yeah. Their father right. is a wealthy football hero. Their mother is a, a beautiful woman who adores them. And really, they should have been able to sort of skyrocket. They right. should have been able to do anything they wanted. And to. on the stand, both of their parents were dragged. Yeah. Uh, Nicole, yeah. Nicole yeah. Simpson's reputation. what that was like for them. Her reputation mm -hmm. was trashed mm -hmm. in the course of this. His reputation was was trashed. And, and you have these innocent children who are already suffering this yeah. tremendous loss. I can't even imagine how they are dealing with this now, with his death. And to see the images of them on television just broke your heart. And then there was the whole black community thinking, well, you know, part of the reason that he's in trouble in the first place is that he's with this beautiful white woman. Remember, they were showing those gorgeous images of her on the mm -hmm. sidelines of the football fields and her hair blowing in the wind and everything. And they were just like, this is retaliation for a black man who got too far. And mm -hmm. I think that his family must have never been able to get over this. And certainly the Brown and Goldman families still don't feel that they've gotten any justice here because he did not go to jail for that murder. And there are a lot of people that still think that He's guilty. Yeah, yeah it's, you know, I talked about like questions of justice, right? Yeah. Because yes, there was the justice for the victims, which is which is the point of a criminal trial. But then mm -hmm. there was this overarching um, theme, I guess, of justice for the African American mm -hmm. community within the justice system that seemed to kind of like overshadow the fact that these two people were right. brutally murdered, and to this day, there has not been a conviction. No a one has been held for accountable this, yeah. for their deaths. Um, and that kind of got pushed by the wayside, and part of it 
You know, we're all part of it. And part of it is because this was the one of the first trials, if not the first one, where the public was able to watch mm -hmm. almost every second of the testimony. Yeah. And we and we, we wasn't even before that. Before. From the moment that that Bronco, that white Bronco, oh, was yeah. traveling down the road in that low speed chase, we were all invested in it, and yeah. we were all captivated and watching every single second of it. What would that be like on social media these days if there mm. would be cameras following him all up and down the expressway? AC getting on the phone. This is AC. I've got OJ in the car. You know who I am. So and everybody true. went, wow. You know, and the car is moving at like five mm. miles an hour. But one other thing I want to say that in 2008, when Simpson was convicted on charges, including kidnapping and armed robbery over the sports memorabilia, a lot of black people thought that that was payback all those mm -hmm. years in prison for not having been sent to prison for the murders of Nicole Brown Simpson and Ron Goldman. Yeah, and, and part of what O.J. had said at certain points was that he was trying to make a life for himself after being convicted in the public's eye in many ways. And it also goes to Anne Marie's point about justice and how he could be acquitted of the crime but still then have a scarlet letter. Yeah. I mean, for so many people involved in this case, um, at least for us, and I don't know what I couldn't imagine was like for them, but this case was where, where everything sort of stops and starts. You know, it's a mm. pivot point. And so as we were talking, I started to think about other, for lack of a better word, characters. Do you remember Cato Caitlin? Yeah. And like yeah. he became like a whole other character, right? This house and guest. And what a character. Yes. Let's not forget the dog. <laughs> Sorry, Allison, what did you say? I said, let's not forget the dog who was almost a celebrity as well, Oh, and well, honest right? to goodness. I mean, all, Every, all those elements and, and what imperfect proxies they were for yes. bigger problems in society. Spot on, spot on. Um, so, of course, we are going to continue to cover the breaking news, which is that O.J. Simpson has died, 76 years old. Uh, we learned in February that he had been diagnosed with prostate cancer and was undergoing chemotherapy treatment. But his family said on X that he has passed away. He was surrounded by family. And they're asking for some privacy at this moment as they deal with this transition. But, of course, the whole country will be talking about him, his life, his legacy, the trial. And, and what, and it, what said, it also revealed about all of us. There you go. All that, right. Anne-Marie has been at it all morning. Mm -hmm. Thank you for letting us join you. But we're going to take a break. When we come back, my colleague Errol Barnett will be with us. And we will continue to bring you reaction to the death of O.J. Simpson. Okay, so let's just start at the beginning. Well, let me start with this. What is at stake here? What is the answer, then? Do you know why? You want me to just keep going? Is that a good thing or a bad thing? Were there death threats? How is this possible? What's wrong with that argument? Are you saying they lied? Have you told the government that? Why won't you say the word crisis? You're not answering my question. This really is that scary? Does that make sense? What do you mean? What does that mean? In Did any of that make what sense? Have you What's your response? What happened? Why? 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 It's time for the CBS News Original 60 Minutes, Sunday on CBS and streaming on Paramount+. Plus. There is no more room in our city. New York City is receiving record numbers of migrants. Today, we're going to have more than 500 adults and children come through that door. Tensions rise as shelters reach max capacity. We don't have to take care of them. CBS Reports goes inside a crisis cities and families are facing as they fight to survive. The United States still has that glimmer of hope for people to come here. Fighting for a future. Now streaming on the free CBS News app. On Face the Nation, the way to learn is to listen. We may have a recession. Listening to how someone explains themselves is so key to understanding their perspective. An original documentary from CBS Reports. Since you started La Soup in 2014, do you have any sense as to how much food you've rescued from the landfill? We've rescued four and a half million pounds. I can't even fathom how much food that is. And that's one little person in one little city in America. We're going to call this chicken piccata. We did 450 of these meals today. This is the exact dish that you and I are going to have. Yep. Oh, my really God. Is it good? Mm-hmm. Having a plan of how to keep people fed should be in every single city. So if we eliminated food waste, could we eliminate hunger? Yes. Eating Trash, now streaming on the free CBS News app.
America Decides, taking you inside American democracy. The most important stories on a day-to-day, hour-to-hour basis. You're going to hear a lot of reporting. It is clearly a pivotal moment. Gun control, the economy, education. Both sides of the political aisle fight it out for power. Bringing you the analysis that you need. Thoughtfully, with context. Be part of the conversation. On CBS News Streaming. Welcome to America Decides. Listen to the My Life of Crime podcast with me, Erin Moriarty. We aim every night to be factual and fair. That's our goal. Sunday morning, actor Kirsten Dunst, plus Wayne Brady on Broadway, and a beloved cherry tree named Stumpy. Hello, everyone. I'm Lana Zak. And I'm Errol Barnett with continuing coverage of this breaking news. Buffalo Bills Hall of Fame running back O.J. Simpson, who was acquitted of the 1994 slayings of his ex-wife and her friend, has died from cancer at the age of 76. He's considered by some to be the greatest running back who ever lived. Simpson was the first man to ever rush for more than 2,000 yards in one season, and he did it in just 14 games. But, of course, he's largely remembered that high-profile murder trial for the killings of his ex-wife, Nicole Brown Simpson, and her friend, Ron Goldman. He was found liable for the killings in a civil suit brought by the victim's families. Carl E. Douglas joins us now. He's a civil rights attorney and was a member of what's known as the Dream Team. Uh, Those were the folks defending O.J. Simpson during the murder trial. Carl, I just want to get your reaction to this news of the death of O.J. Simpson, and perhaps you can share with us your experiences with the man. Well, first of all, thank you so much for having me on your show this morning. I was surprised, even shocked, when I learned about O.J.'s death this morning. He had a very complicated legacy, Mm -hmm. and I'm sure that while some will only remember him as someone who was accused of two brutal murders, as you stated, I knew him first as a football star here in Los Angeles when he starred at USC. I knew him second as a National Football League running back, setting mileage records and yardage records for all. And then I knew him third as an icon who was able to go and move from athletics to commercial exploitation, both on a corporate side and in Hollywood. Before Michael Jackson, Before Tiger Woods, there was O.J. Simpson running through airports and highways, hawking cereal, cars, and rental car agencies. Uh, I certainly send my condolences out to his four children, and it's impossible on this day to not remember that two young lives were taken far too soon, and we must always remember that as well. Yeah, I appreciate that, Carl. I appreciate also that... Um, as you point out, the different lenses from which people had that, that touchstone to O.J. Simpson in many ways influenced how they felt about him. Uh, I'm wondering, given that you were part of the team that, that saw him acquitted, that got him that acquittal, um, to later see him serve time in prison because, of convicted, uh, because he was convicted of armed robbery and kidnapping, as people are trying to process even that, uh, I'm, I'm curious about how you processed it when that happened. I was devastated years later when I heard about his arrest in Vegas. But at the same time, I believe the sentence that he received in that case was a payback for the acquittal that we obtained in Los Angeles. The crime that he committed in Vegas was probably a two-year crime dripping wet. But for that judge to impose a sentence of nine years, for that 33 years, for that judge to 
polled the jury so that the verdict would come on the anniversary of the verdict in our case in 1995, says to me that there was some connection, regrettably, and that justice was not served in that matter, at least. Carl, let's just take a moment for our viewers. Uh, let's keep in mind that while the entire country was transfixed on every moment of that trial, you had millions of viewers. There are some people watching who weren't alive then, and this was before their time. Mm. So just for our viewers, I want to reset what was the culmination of that weeks and months long uh, murder trial. You were part of the team defending OJ Simpson when the judge came back and the jury returned the verdict. Let's just look back at that for a moment. In the matter of the people of the state of California versus Orenthal James Simpson, case number BA097211. We, the jury, in the above entitled action, find the defendant Orenthal James Simpson not guilty of the crime of murder in violation of Penal Code Section 187. Take us back to that moment. Where were you if you were in the room? And did you believe that would be the verdict? I was sitting inside the well, right by the swinging door, right in back of Lee Bailey, who was at the front desk. And let me tell you, I've only cried out of joy two times in my life. Once when my son was born, and second at the O.J. Simpson verdict that day, because that was for us as trial lawyers the culmination of 16 months of effort, day in, day out, Saturday, Sunday, evening, and for a trial lawyer to have success in their effort, vindicating the time and the effort that we nine lawyers expended away from our families, away from our law practices, was in fact a great a great victory for trial lawyers everywhere. It's also important to remember that O.J. Simpson happened to have millions of dollars that he was willing to spend on his own defense. And it really raised the specter of how public defender agencies across this nation lacked the resources that O.J. Simpson had so that we could combat the awesome power of the state by having investigators, expert witnesses on our own side as well. And it takes that level of resource for public defenders nationwide to be able to combat the awesome power of the state. So okay. that case, I think, was a bellwether for that as well. And Carl, I think that that is an excellent point because he was the most well-resourced uh, mm. in, in order to try and afford the dream team and be able um, to to hire the best attorneys and have that time, and other defendants don't have that. Um, but it also, I think, when you're speaking, it also goes to a point that Anne Marie and I were making about truths about the justice system that were revealed through this case, even, even if it's imperfect, even if you felt like, uh, like the, the decision was not the one that you at home would have come to. I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit, especially as a black attorney, being in front of America, uh, as were other members of the Dream Team, trying to defend this black man who had become uh, a celebrity uh, that was adored by the public, regardless of race. What truths were revealed through the course of this trial that are still being struggled with today? Your listeners don't understand that era of our country. That was before the internet. Emails were not as widely used as today. That's before Twitter, Facebook, or X, Instagram. So everyone was transfixed on this case and on this trial that was being led by an African-American attorney. What that case did for the image of Black lawyers everywhere was significant because it reflected the fact that competence comes in all colors. To this day, 30 years later, I am embraced by members of the black and brown community because of the work that I did on behalf of O.J. Simpson. For decades, centuries, black and brown people have believed that the system did not work for us, that racism was 
permeating our system and making it impossible for justice ever to be found by black and brown defendants. And whatever you think of this verdict, for black Americans, it was not speaking about O.J. Simpson per se. He didn't speak to the black community in the ways that other black icons did. But for the system, for black lawyers to be successful, for people to believe that at least once in our history, the system acknowledged the excellence of black lawyering, that was a watershed event for all of the country to observe. And I'm proud to have been a part of that nine-member team. And Carl, before we let you go, as we speak to you on the, the news of O.J. Simpson's death at 76 years old, do you feel that in the years after this trial and that controversial verdict, that he ever really repaired his reputation? It's unfortunate because the one thing that O.J. always wanted at the conclusion of this case was that he would be able to return to the community that he loved. And regrettably, he did not have that benefit in his life. Although if you were to have asked O.J., he would always remember the fan who beloved him, even after the case. He would always speak and be mindful of those that would ask for autographs or pictures and he would ignore the other. But it is regrettable that this great athlete, this icon, had, had his career and his legacy so soiled by the events of 1994 and 1995. And regrettably, it is those events and that trial, I believe, that will remain the primary aspect of his legacy moving forward in history. Well, as we're talking about his legacy, he was not a perfect man. He was not a perfect vessel for, uh, for understanding race relations in America. Um, he uh, wasn't a perfect vessel even for understanding the criminal justice system. As you point out, he had more resources than others. Uh, and then he was later convicted uh, um, in a criminal trial for armed robbery. It's a complicated legacy. How do you think he should be remembered? It is impossible for any fair-minded person to examine the career of O.J. Simpson, one, without acknowledging his tremendously efficient contribution to the sports world, but at the same time, understanding and acknowledging as well that his entire legacy will be soiled by the memory of that trial in 1995, even though he was found not guilty of those charges. It is regrettable, but that will, I'm sure, be the legacy that will always remain. And Carl, what about for you? Did you face any backlash throughout your career because of the, the verdict? I fortunately have been uplifted in my career for the last 30 years since the O.J. Simpson trial, I remember quite easily when I first would appear in court after that trial and announce my name and my having worked at the law offices of Johnny L. Cochran Jr. Everyone in the courtroom would stop and listen because that name resonated. I was able to open my own law firm successfully a couple of years after that. And I modeled my practice over the Johnny L. Cochran Law Firm model. And my success, I am sure, was in some small part a reflection of the successful efforts that we had on behalf of O.J. Simpson in 1995. So certainly, I acknowledge and understand that my name will likely always be linked with his until my death. Well, Carl Douglas, uh, a member of the Dream Team that secured uh, that uh, not guilty verdict for O.J. Simpson. Thanks for joining us on this Thank news you. of O.J. Simpson's death. We appreciate it. Thanks for having me. And we will continue to cover that breaking event as well as some other big stories for you here on CBS News, including another group of aid workers uh, was almost caught in the crossfire in Gaza. What we know about this incident and how hostage talks could be impacted by the killing of a Hamas leader's sons. You're streaming CBS News.
Mr. President, there's a lot to talk about. A lot to talk about. Does this carrier strike group stand ready? It's just incredible to see there's an active search and rescue operation going on 12 hours after this accident. The CBS Evening News with Nora O'Donnell.